So we're going to talk about placemaking, uh, and we're going to talk, and I'm going to kind of do it through the um, through the the lens of the, the the history of how we did things at Big Car. So Big Car is a nonprofit arts organization, started in 2004 as an all volunteer group of artists, um, web designers, just different creative people who helped us put together uh, an initiative that was really to bring. Um, some programming, some art programming, and to offer an opportunity for people in Indianapolis and in, in a particular neighborhood where many of us lived to really kind of start the ball rolling on having art be central to this neighborhood, and that neighborhood is called Fountain Square. So um, these are some images here just from the things that we've been doing lately, and we'll come back to it. So after a little while, we developed this mission, which was really the idea of bringing art to people and people to art. And so we started to figure out early on that a big part of what we needed to do was not to just expect everybody to come to us, but to, take, to bring our uh, passion for art and opportunities for art out to people where they were. And so a lot of our work um, in the very beginning was in an art building, and we worked really hard to get people to come to that area, to that neighborhood, we also started reaching out into the into the community right uh, nearby. We do a lot of this work through what is called creative placemaking or placemaking, and the idea of it is that it's artists who are leading with the community, um, with every every kind of community member, these collaborative projects. So they're not something that anybody's doing on their own, but it's something that's built on collaboration and teamwork in the community. And the number one ingredient for placemaking, in my view, is people. So you can't make a, a good place that nobody goes to. And so if you see um, a place that doesn't have any kind of human activity, there's probably something wrong with not only the design, but also this, the method of activating that place. So a lot of what we do and what we've done over time is figuring out ways to activate places and make it so that people want to go there. So in Fountain Square, is where we started working in around 2000. We were officially a nonprofit by 2004. We, um, we did some work in, in kind of these um, parking lots and kind of available spaces. So this, this project here, this was part of a thing called Masterpiece in a Day that we worked with another artist who started it to really have an art competition that in, involved um, artists making their work out in the public where people could see them make it and then they would win prizes. And then we added a writing competition and a performing competition. So there was a music competition too. And a lot of what was happening is um, with the music competition, for instance, songwriters had to make a song about the neighborhood in the neighborhood in a day. And the way we managed to make sure they didn't do it ahead of time is they paired up with somebody they didn't even know. And then they, had, they just got in these random pairings and they collaborated on this song and performed it. And then we would do the performances and then have other kinds of music and stuff on these, uh, in this parking lot that was owned by the bank and was just on this corner. So this pop-up thing that happened there on the corner led to uh, some thinking about what could really be there. And you can see that the dominant element here is really the street. And so this, this street is taken over and people are kind of trying to find a place to stand and stay out of the street, and then they're on the other side of the street sitting to watch the bands. So what came after this, and this is what we would consider, this is back in 2004, so no one was talking about placemaking or tactical urbanism at that time. But what this did was this temporary thing led to a permanent change that happened to this spot. And so now it has this built infrastructure, and so what went from being a setup like this was that was more temporary as now this, this kind of permanent structure. So it still needs, though, um, activation. So you can't just put a thing like that there and then all of a sudden it's a vibrant place. And so the neighborhood invested a lot of money and did a lot of fundraising to be able to build this out, but then they didn't have any money left for programming. So sometimes there's stuff happening and sometimes there's not. And then sometimes there's a miscalculation in the design and you end up making things that people want to sit on that were really not designed for sitting and you don't have any place for them to sit. So these guys are sitting on like kind of like this broken um, limestone that they had out for a fountain that wasn't running, so people would just sit on it anyway. So back in 2004 through 2006, we were doing programming in this gallery space that we had, 
and a lot of it was really about having fun and the people that were there were really people kind of a smaller group of people who knew each other and we'd see the same people and we had but a lot of what we did then was getting people to be on a first Friday rotation so every first Friday there was a new art show people would come back and visit the neighborhood and come to the galleries to work, as we moved along in our run over the next couple of years we started to to move towards this idea of what if the shows in the gallery weren't just made by artists but they were also made by the visitors. So we started to, to break down that barrier between the artists over here and then the people who come to the shows are over here or there um, sometimes you'll see there's a little corner where you can do something if you're a visitor but everything else is, is for the artists. So the shows that we started to turn started to do more of were things like this collage show where the middle of the gallery was a big pile of stuff and then people could come in and they could make art together and then put it on the wall. So it still had artists and the artists in our group participated, but we were able to bring in other people. In that. And then I think we really found that this participation model gave people a, a connection and a, a strong feeling about us and also about the idea of themselves as uh, you know, capable and worthy of being included in the gallery show. So then that all that stuff back there that went up on the wall was created by whoever came into the room over the course of the show. So around this time, we, we came to a point when, um, when we were starting to think about how we could um, do a little bit more. And around 2008, 2009, um, the economy was having its challenges. Um, you started to have this, um, this change. In, and so one of the things that uh, we had really early was YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. So we, we started our organization at the same time those things were starting. So this overlay, which is from this um, technical urbanism guide, um, shows that right at the time when we were starting in the mid-2000s, you had these things changing about the way the world worked. And you had not only a kind of a downturn in the economy, but you had this way to crowdsource things and you started to see that there was this, so you end up in this middle part of the diagram where you have this idea that technical things could happen with those things coming together. Crowdsourcing opportunities, social media, and um, the, need, the need that was really there. So in uh, 2011, we found, uh, we were part of a planning uh, charrette for this area called Lafayette Square, which is a first ring suburban area in Indianapolis. And there was a lot of vacant buildings. There's almost a, a half vacant large mall. Has anybody ever been to Lafayette Square Mall in Indianapolis? So it used to be this big regional draw, and then things started to change with the neighborhood, and things started changing also with retail because of Amazon and all this different stuff. And so you had this empty mall, and out in front of the mall you had this um, Firestone shop. And you know how at, in malls, there are like a Goodyear or a Firestone, and they're out closer to the street. So in the planning charrette, a lot of what people talked about was, why don't we, these things are all set back. It would be nice if this stuff was up on the street, like in, the, in a regular downtown area. So we were there looking at it and thinking, well, that would be kind of cool to use that for something. And the security guard came up and said, what are you guys doing? And we said we were interested in this space. And um, he put us in touch with somebody from the leasing office, and so... Chate and I and a few others talked to them, and, and we asked if we could just use the building, and we were kind of surprised that they said that we could, and we just had to pay basically $100 a month for this 12,000 square foot building um, on a busy street. Some of the challenges though, that we faced was that this is the front parking lot, so this is sort of the barrier between the street and the building itself. So we started thinking about what we could do to follow that idea and move this, the building closer to the street, so to get rid of that barrier. And people love to cut through that, too. So, you know, if you were outside or whatever, there'd be somebody zooming through there to cut in and make it around through the whole thing. That's what people were crisscrossing through the parking lot. So we started studying some of the things that other people were doing um, to put, to grow um, gardens on top of asphalt. So this is a restaurant in Minnesota, and this is in San Francisco, down in the, um, near their city hall. So we created this design 
and at first it was a fairly conservative design, um, and then we asked, we reached out to tree services to, to just drop their mulch off. So when a tree falls over or somebody wants their brush cleared up, they'll just mulch it up and then they'll take it somewhere, compost it or whatever. So we just said, well, you guys just drop that off. And that way we didn't have to pay for a bunch of mulch because we were going to use mulch to be the base for the bed and then you put dirt on top of it and that's how you protect yourself from getting into the asphalt and any kind of contamination from the asphalt. Um, but what happened was it was um, <laughs> it was a stormy spring and they kept on bringing it. So we had this mountain of and mulch will smolder inside. So the fire trucks came and we were just like, oh, we got to do something about this. So we had we didn't want to take it away. So we just decided let's go ahead and build really pretty big um, beds and we set it up as a garden and did the rows. People got creative and did their own DNA strand bed. Um, so these were volunteer groups that did all this work. Um, some of us knew about things and some of us didn't. And so I, I think I was responsible for ordering what I thought were straw bales, but they were hay bales to be the edge. And hay is for feed and it's softer, as I know now. Um, so who knew there was a big difference between hay, hay and straw? So we worked, on, we worked with it and we dealt with it. Um, and things started to grow, but you can see that the edge was starting to kind of get a little bit beat down. And from the street, it looked fine to us, but some people wanted it to look better. We grew sweet, sweet potatoes that we traded for pies at the local bakery and um, market. And then when fall came around, we decided that we needed to do a better job building out the edge of the bed. So we partnered with um, Eli Lilly and company does a big day of service every fall. And they, um, they came along and they, um, and they did a really big volunteer day where we added murals and we uh, built out the garden um, to, to be a, a nicer looking space. So they did these murals. They worked really fast, as you can see. <laughs> they really did work really fast. There were 400 of them throughout the day. And we just had these teams of artists who had to manage all this work. Um, the, the Lily employees, a lot of the, like the ones who painted the, um, the mural on the other building that looked like Joseph Albers' work, they were scientists, and so they were really very good about um, being particular. All this happened in one day. That's amazing. That was the crew of people that um, managed the day. Mm -hmm. So by the end of that, you know, we had um, a nicer looking garden that the neighbors were happier with. Um, we had a, if you've ever heard of Don of Don's Guns, uh, he was our neighbor next door, and he was not always exactly happy with what we were doing. Um, but I think everybody felt better once this was built out and it seemed a little <coughs> bit more permanent. Mm -hmm. And then in the inside of the space we started having programming and exhibitions. We used the garage to have these kind of experimental and other kinds of music shows. We had partner events. This is with the uh, Indie Film Fest and they did a, a fundraiser that would, where designers would make new mov a, a new version of old movies, posters for old movies. And then you could kind of see how the garden shaped up, it became this public space. And that was all really stuff that was done through volunteer work, a little bit of um, support through the Lily Day of Service, and then we had all kinds of, you know, unusual things that happened over there, you know, like pony rides for adults in front of the mall. That's the mall in the background. So it was this kind of this um, juxtaposition of this non-commercial space in a co totally commercial area and also this green thing in a sea of asphalt and cement, which is everything that was around there. So we had people who would come and have picnics there and bring their kids and hang out and play. Um, you know, we, we, we even played with the, all the signage that was around and kind of made it a little more fun. Um, and then an artist named Nat Russell created these different sculptural pieces that were out in the garden.
So all along we knew this was a temporary project, but it ended up being almost a four-year temporary project. So we started to get more and more comfortable with our situation because the deal was if they found a full paying rent, or full rent paying tenant, then we would move out in three months. And so this is Lafayette Square, and um, you know, we didn't figure anybody would want to move in there because there were a lot of available spaces. So along that time, we started to look at this. This is a book uh, put out by Project for Public Spaces. And we started to realize that we really were doing placemaking and that we were doing it in a successful way. So these things were some of the things that this How to Turn a Space Around, Our Place Around book kind of highlighted. So when we started looking at what we were doing, we found that we were really making this stuff happen out there. Including in this sort of wasteland area, we were getting people to ride our bikes out there. And we were getting people to use mass transit. There's a bus stop right in front of our, our place that started to become uh, used more often that we made nicer and had benches and areas for people to hang out. And people felt comfortable there and groups would use it so you had a lot of people hanging out and it was a place where you had kids um, participating in various activities and this is one of my favorite ones on that list is that you had people showing affection sitting by each other and um, you know when you see that a public space is really working you'll see people holding hands people like um, you know wanting to be close with each other so all this was going great and then we had to move so um, again we kind of knew that could happen we didn't really expect it so then we packed everything up and we had to take the garden apart and we ended up donating the, a lot of the soil which is really valuable and we had made a bunch of soil too by with the mulch turning into soil and so that all got shipped over to various places and um, repurposed and I still see it around all over in the city. So about that time we started working in some other neighborhoods so we got invited to do some work in an even more challenged area of the city. This is kind of what it's like out there. And this is the far east side of Indianapolis. One of the projects that we worked on, we talked about this a little bit today at lunch with some people, uh, or this morning at breakfast, um, was a project called Galleria Magnifica. And so in a, in a Mexican grocery store out there, we thought we would start to put a gallery in. And we, they had these little salon rooms. So there was a hair salon, and then this one had been like a call center or some weird check cashing or something and was available. So we rented it from, from the owner and um, converted it into, into that space there and made it a place where bi a bilingual location for participatory art making. So people would come in and, and they would like, with the collage show, they would contribute their own um, creativity to this exhibition that was in that space. And this is a guy named Eduardo Luna who works for us, who is really our liaison with the Hispanic community and other immigrants and refugees. So he's working with them all the time, um, getting them connected to, to art and also us learning uh, from the community. Another project that we did, and this is kind of along the tactical urbanism side of things, was at a community fun day, we worked on a way to connect this apartment complex to the Mexican grocery store. And so one of the things that we did, which was a pretty fun adventure, was we painted crosswalks on the street using flour and water so it would run off. Um, no one said anything. To, they had a lot of other things to worry about out there, so <laughs> nobody from the city or the police said anything to us. And if they were, we were prepared to explain it was just flour. <coughs> and another thing that we did was there was a desire line that was between the apartment mm -hmm. complex and the, and the grocery store. And so we just decided that what we would do is mulch that and then put some benches mm -hmm. so that you could have a, a nicer path. And this was an idea that we've, we've had a lot of visits to Detroit, and this was an idea that we kind of picked up from a place called Sit On It in Detroit, where they re, repurpose wood to make benches around the community, and they would, were doing a design line project like this there. Another thing that we did out, 46235 is the zip code for that area, we started doing a uh, some literal bringing art to people through a, a partnership with the bookmobile and we would come out and follow the bookmobile out to the neighborhoods and then set up tables and make art with the kids um, and their families um, in the community. Sometimes it would be like simple things like that. Um, one of the projects we worked on 
with the kids was to sort of crowdsource this idea that we had, which was to make a better mobile vehicle to take along with the bookmobile. So kids contributed their ideas on the design. And then um, this, is, this is the thing that we ended up making, which is called the Wagon of Wonders. And so it's this, um, it's this box that's a trailer that's really built on the frame of a ice fishing trailer. So in Minnesota they have, they'll drive this thing out on the lake, lower it to the lake, and then they have a hole in it that they open up, and then they fish inside there, and then they have a bar and a <laughs> chair and a bathroom and everything inside. It's kind of not roughing it. Um, so we build our own on the frame, and it's this kind of museum on wheels that lowers down so it doesn't look like a trailer anymore. It just looks like this box is just there. And it has these interactive components, and it has a little library, and people can dance on it if they're approved <laughs> to do so. Um, and so this was, um, this is an ongoing project that we have. It has a gallery in the back. Um, and, it, and we'll come back to some of this stuff, because this was done at Monument Circle. It also has a little DJ thing that we can set up outside. And then we do a lot of this kind of programming where we, you know, bring activities out for people to participate in. And it's just right there for them. And then we'll have staff members who will say, hey, do you want to color? Do you want to draw something? Do you want to contribute to this? And then they'll look at you for a second and think about it. And then, OK. And then they sit down. And it's just it's like no pressure. But we usually do put their things up. We'll say, do you want to keep it? Or do you want to put it up in the, in the exhibition spot? And, and it's just a cork board. And a lot of times people will be really kind of happy that you want to put their thing up. And so it's like putting it on the refrigerator at home. But these are adults, and they're like, oh, yeah, I want to put it up there. I see all the other ones. And then they can also see examples of what other people did, and they're not the first one or the only one. So another thing that uh, we've been working on is a, is a project that is really about a little bit about neighborhood identity and a little bit about um, about social um, stickiness and helping people feel attracted to their community and connected to their community. Um, this is another idea that we learned about in Detroit and met with the people and talked with the people who organized this league. And the idea of it is the neighborhoods have their own soccer team. And so they play each other, um, and they are a team from their neighborhood. So neighbors get to know each other better, and they get connected with each other, and then they have these opportunities, like this is at the at Garfield Park, uh, where we played one of the seasons. They hang out before their games, they get to know each other. Afterwards, there are after parties, and people go and have a beer, get some pizza, or whatever. And so from within the neighborhood, they get to know each other. They have really, they develop pride in their neighborhood, and they also get to know other neighbors from other neighborhoods. And then the identity of that neighborhood becomes more clearly established so people know that's an existing neighborhood. Um, we played a little bit down at White River State Park. That's the JW Marriott downtown. One of the neat things that came out of this was this designer named Ross Montgomery. Um, he, for some reason, um, likes to design, redesign NFL and NBA logos. And he just does it for fun and puts it on his website. He has a real, he has a design job, but he just does this too. So the people who were helping us get the league started knew about Ross's stuff and reached out to him and said, well, if you're just going to do that anyway for NFL teams, why don't you do it for neighborhoods? And so he created, the, we came up with the names that kind of fit um, sort of international soccer team naming uh, approaches. And we asked uh, Ross to design these logos. So when you go back to the shirts, these, these shirts will have these logos on them. And, and then now the neighborhoods and the soccer teams have these other logos they can just use. So it was a way to get an identity that, and a team built and to actually do team building through actually having a real team. And there, the league was set up to be co-ed and as non-competitive as humanly possible. And we all know how, how humans are. So there was some competitiveness, but it was by design not supposed to allow it to get too far. So kind of the biggest project that I think, one of the biggest projects we've ever done, if not the biggest, happened last summer. And the city of Indianapolis um, got this grant from the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with us. 
that was through the Our Town program. If you guys don't know about the Our Town program, it's something you should look into. It's a, it's a, the program is funds specifically city partnerships, municipal partnerships with arts organizations. And the grant is up to $200,000. So we were one of the only two or three in the country to get the full amount of money in, in 2015. So what we were focused on, how many of you guys have been to Monument Circle in Indianapolis? Okay, so this is it from above. Um, and so what we're focused on is how could we, there was, so 30% along in a plan, the, the city and some planners are 30% along in a plan for how to renovate Monument Circle infrastructure-wise and to reimagine it as a, as a more, it's already a pretty good people-oriented space, but even better, and to make it, uh, to expand the area for people along the edge. And so the grant was for us to try out some ideas and test those ideas in that space for a period of time and to program that space and, and actually do what ended up being kind of a one-to-one -one scale plan on, on the ground in the middle of it while it was happening. So we set out to, and these were already kind of our, um, our way of thinking and the goals that we kind of have for, for our work, but we applied this to this space and we thought about how can we think about ways to make Monument Circle a place where people are able to enjoy creativity, to in, engage in, um, curious, you know, be more curious, to, to be better informed about each other and about their community, and also to feel better connected with each other and to feel healthier, to be healthier, and to feel happier. And ultimately, our goal is, and this is sort of a broad one, but if people are feeling happier, then we're accomplishing what we want to, to see in the community. So we, one of the things we decided to do is, let's, the city wanted us to move the pedestrian zone, the sidewalk out eight feet from where it is. And so to put, these, these are called parklets and they're basically um, a deck or something that you would put in the street that um, is up to the level of the sidewalk and it has a border on it and you can sit there. So it's like outdoor seating at a restaurant but it's in the street. We had to do, um, because this was in the city right away and we were de dealing with city, city people, this little simple thing that we were building had to be approved by structural engineers and all these things including this advice desk that we built that was approved by a structural engineer. Um, so we came up with renderings, we got all this stuff approved, we designed this welcome trailer, which is a kind of a concession trailer that you'd have at the fair, and that was a really important thing to have out there. <coughs> the idea was that we would be standing there, and if people needed things, they could come up to us, and that was something that was missing at Monument Circle. There's just like nowhere to turn, you're just wandering around, you don't know who to ask questions. And we had created a daily calendar that was also approved by the, our partners with the city. And so they knew what was coming up. They didn't want us to just spontaneously do a bunch of stuff down there. They kind of wanted to know what was, what was happening. Which ended up um, being helpful for us. And then every day we would publish this daily schedule of what happened out there. And we would put that out on Twitter and share it on Facebook. And so people would know, if I'm going to come down there, this is what I'm going to encounter. So what you ended up with down there was a lot of opportunities for people to have fun, to get together, to play games, to socialize, to participate in, in projects like um, artist-led or historian-led walks that started and ended at the circle. Um, games were a really popular thing. People came down and play, played pickup chess. Um, the parklets were really well used. I've got some numbers for that. Um, and the welcome trailer ended up being this um, concierge desk to downtown in a lot of ways. So visitors would come and say, "Oh, how, where's the closest CVS? Or you know, where should I go to eat? Or what you know, what is this down here?" And, and we had people, who, and their, their job was basically to answer those kinds of questions. Um,
that was the man. I ain't got to worry, don't care about tomorrow. No, no, no. Mommy cook me in the kitchen alone. 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 So that's a little bit of a glimpse into all the stuff that was happening down there. So it was a lot of stuff. We packed a lot into 11 weeks, and it was seven days a week, open every day, um, with varying degrees of activity on it. So Mondays were a little slower, or Sundays were family days. So every day had its own theme. Thursday was Throwback Thursday, so we had history elements on Thursdays. Wednesdays were Walking Wednesdays, so we encouraged people to go on walks and sit around. Um, and one of the two of the things that I think are really important that we did, that I'm really glad we did, one was we hired uh, a guy named Kirk Nettleton, who's an artist and a videographer and a, film, and a photographer, to, to be on site with us and to spend, he, he's full time with us as an ongoing employee. And even a big institution like the Indianapolis Museum of Art, they don't have a full time video person. But we felt like that was a really a valuable thing for us to have, just so that we could capture things like that. So if we did that project and we didn't really capture it in a way that we could share like that, it's all gone. So if you go to Monument Circle right now, there's no trace of Spark, nothing. Just people remember it. But we do have these videos, and Kurt has created a whole series of videos that highlight what every day was like down there. And, and the different musicians who play all have these nice videos of their performances. So there's a real good document of that that anyone can go see that we can show that this is what happened. So no one can say, well, it didn't really work, no one was down there, it wasn't very diverse, or anything like that, because all we have to do is say, hey, watch that video, and, and or any of these other videos, or look at any of these photos. So I think that's something we learned from the very beginning, that you have to really do a good job of documenting your work when you're doing placemaking or socially engaged art, because it doesn't result in a sculpture that anyone can go up and knock on. It, it's gone after you do the event. But what isn't gone is really the, the residual effect of the community that's built, the vibrancy that's built, or the things that really happen that come from that. Or in the case of Spark, a lot of knowledge for the plan that is still in process. So we were able to pass all that knowledge on in our partnership with the city to the people who are continuing that plan. So it's a better informed plan. So if you're in a, if, if you think about designing a space and you're doing it from a room somewhere and you're in, in a computer program and you're just trying to do the best you can, that's totally different than if you're living in a space pretty much for 11 weeks every day, all day. So we had tons of really good ideas. The other thing that we did this time um, that we haven't always done as well is we really did a good job surveying people, doing counts, and making sure we were tracking data so that we had all that stuff. And another person that's really instrumental to our work is a guy named Andy Fry, who's our, our designer, graphic designer, who also did sound and work. All of us do a lot of different stuff down there. So Andy designed, you can tell the difference between my slides and Andy's slides. So Andy designed these slides for, for us, but these are just a way to kind of highlight the numbers. So we have counts on how many people. So the people that were down there using the chairs, doing the programming, all the things that weren't there before, it's a, it's a huge number over 11 weeks. Um, we created, when we talk about human scale programs, we're talking about things that people can do right on the street that are little interactions, opportunities to just <coughs> listen, to participate. We did a lot of work with artists, so we had 125 artists who were employed by this, this project. Um, 
and we put two hundred thousand dollars into the economy of Indianapolis from outside of it. So the NEA gave us two hundred thousand dollars that went right in to the pocket of these artists and, and was invested in the city. That's a pretty good thing. And so we were able to turn that around and um, you know just put ninety percent of that budget towards the artists and the and the arts organizations. So it wasn't going anywhere else. It was really a big a chunk of change for artists. We were able to then also see an increase in sales at the restaurants that were around the circle. So they reported even needing to hire extra staff to work. And on a kind of human level, we were able to um, have people spend more time down there. So 85% of the people who came down into the survey, they stayed longer than they would have otherwise. So that was one of the goals. Let's get, this is a nice space. Why do, don't people stay longer? Why don't they spend time there? And we, we had you know, this really interesting thing that we were getting 30 people to spend 30 minutes to an hour down there instead of just passing through. So that's what you want in a public space. And people were visiting from all over. Um, they were coming from outside of America, from elsewhere in the state, and from out of state. But still, the biggest thing was this, is a, this was a, a local serving program. It, was, it wasn't just for tourists. And it wasn't just for out-of-city, out of out-of-state visitors. And I like this one a lot. 85% of people who went down there had a conversation with somebody new. So that's a very important social thing. I mean, now even more than ever, you you don't have this opportunity. And it says 30% of those 85 didn't usually talk to strangers. So that's like a whole bunch of people getting to know each other and having the social interaction. And and I like the, also this information about 24% of them just would come down there by themselves. So some of the people who are playing chess, they would just come down and, and wait for somebody to sit down across from them and play chess. And how often does that happen? nowadays in, in society. We were also tripling the amount of people who were sitting outside now. So we put all these chairs out, people wanted to sit there, and they did. So you, you go from a typical day um, when there's like 45 to 50 people without the chairs and without the amenities, and then you triple that to up to 150 people out there sitting around on chairs. We also learned the things that people really wanted and what brought them down there, like I said at the very beginning, was other people. So the number one reason was because of other people being there. And that was their draw. And then we also figured out through this test, if, and, and we're planning to do this again this year with the city, we know what people really like. They like playing games. They like these fun things. And we know where to really invest um, in future programming. Another interesting thing that we did down there was we had a project that sort of morphed into this bigger project, and we ended up um, making it, uh, making historic postcards <coughs> available for people to fill out, and, and we would mail them for free anywhere in the world. So we sent 3,000 postcards over the course of 11 weeks, all over the world, highlighting Monument Circle. And some of them were. This is an example of one that we took and modified to be kind of like a coloring book page uh, postcard, so people could color it in and send it, so they could customize it. And then some of them, all you had to do was write your message on the back and send it. That's something that we really learned from that experience that, that we now we're taking it to other events and doing it because it's it's just a really personal thing, but it's um, postcards are interesting by design because they're not private. You know, they're on the back of a card, so we can gather that from people and we don't have to worry about them expecting privacy on what they wrote or anything. So we can have them bouncing around and we can send them. So I want to talk just just for a few more minutes about a couple of other things along the lines of the neighborhood identity. Um, this project is in the neighborhood that we're working in now, and um, which is called Garfield Park. And what we are doing there, or what we started out with this neighborhood doing, was creating this mural that that was a gateway to the neighborhood and that also was a collaboratively designed mural with the neighbors. So they gave us a lot of input. They told us what they thought was important to include. You know, and they also talked about colors that they thought really stood for the neighborhood. So we went through this design process with them over the course of a couple of months. And then we ended up going to the park and working with them. They all, and the neighbors all painted it. 
and then we touched it up and installed it in the neighborhood right at, at the edge of the entrance and then we ended up with this really point of pride in the neighborhood. And then the assets that came out of that included they, that thing was a t-shirt, it, it, part of that turned into a logo, and so the neighborhood has all this stuff that kind of came out of that process. <laughs> We also worked with the neighborhood to do a thing called a better block two times where we temporarily reimagined the street as a more pedestrian friendly um, street. We made good use of this is turf that was left over from the Super Bowl practice fields that we ended up getting hold of. Um, it smells like cat pee, um, <laughs> but we kind of dealt with it. I don't think anybody wants to touch it again. Um, but it created crosswalks without painting on the street. And, and I like this picture because um, this is a really busy area and cars would just stop for pedestrians in the middle of the street and we didn't have any incidents. And, it, and an outcome, a couple of outcomes from this were that there were two neighborhood associations, a south one and a north one, and we, of north of the park and south of the park. And we got them together to work on these two better blocks. And so in the end, they decided to merge into one neighborhood association instead of the two. They also, um, the other outcome was some businesses opened and even people, some of the volunteers who participated, what you do in a better block is you'll use um, vacant commercial spaces and get the owner to let you borrow it for the day, like kind of like a short term version of what we did in Lafayette Square. And when those spaces were um, utilized, people started to imagine, okay, well maybe this can make, we can make a go of this. And so a couple who lived in the neighborhood decided to start a restaurant and had been a vacant space for a number of years. So now our next thing is to really work in this neighborhood. So the, that stretch that over there on the left is, is the street that we were doing the better block on. And at going way back in time, when we got when we moved out of, of Lafayette Square, we started looking for a new place, and we found this old factory building, which had been uh, a dairy processing center originally. I found that matchbook on eBay. Uh, that place had opened in 1908, and so we asked these guys again, like we did the last time, could we use your building, thinking that we would just rent it from them for cheap or something. And they said, well, we don't really want it anymore. And it turned out that they were art supporters, that the family that owned it, was, but they were art supporters. And so we were able to get this building, and it's probably valued at like $250,000 for $40,000. So then we said, okay, now let's get busy working on this. We got a community development block grant through the city. It's a federal a HUD grant, and it, that grant ended up being to purchase this building, do renovation, purchase another building that I'll talk about in a second. We got $466,000. We had never really owned any property before. We partnered with the Community Development Corporation that had owned a lot of property. And in that, that whole Community Development Block Grant process happened over the course of like two weeks. So we're used to applying for a grant for $20,000, waiting six months, and then you find out you did or didn't get it, or they give you 15, and you're just like, okay. And that takes a whole year. But we had $466,000 available in like two or three weeks. and so. We were able to take that, and this is the building down below now, and we're in the process of renovating it and turning it into um, to what is called tube, tube factory. It was a tube factory. Um, we like these literal names. Um, so that, and the this is kind of what this space is starting to look like on the inside. Um, so it it opens at the end of um, April. The other building is this place that, when we did the Better Block, we did an art show inside of this appliance shop. And uh, we did had artists do art about appliances, and we hung it on the appliances. Um, and then that business closed, and we knew Cody, the owner, and it, we had called him up and said, what's going on? And he said, my uncle owns it, he wants to sell it, he wants $68,000. So around the same time that we were able to get the Community Development Block Grant, or we were applying, we had asked for funds to buy this, and we were able to purchase it as part of that grant. So this is what it looks like now. It's opening the end of this month. And what's going on in there is, you know, when you think about what are the things that could spark some change in a community, we thought a record store, a coffee shop, um, a little corner food market, and, um, and then 
we also got a low, a, a low power FM radio station license. So we decided well, we'll put all that stuff in this one little building. So all that, that's going to be happening in there. So the partnership, the, all the retail stuff is in partnership with existing businesses. So a record store in town, Haluna, is our partner on the record. So we're not going to have to develop a whole business. <coughs> we're just partnering with existing businesses. So that's, that's the space at night. And there's bleachers in there that you can sit at and watch performances and also look outside the garage door to the street, which is something that we built. Um, you know, so basically, you know, the goals in here are come back to the same things that we were talking about with Garfield Park or with Monument Circle. We want to really increase the quality of life and make this a better place for people. The other element of this project is there are vacant homes in the neighborhood on the street where our building is. Ten of the homes out of the 20 were vacant and boarded up. So we've been with Riley Area Development, our partner, purchasing these houses. And they're going to be available for artists to live in as uh, affordable artist housing. The last element of this work is working on the streetscape and making it so that it goes from being mostly car-oriented to being uh, people-oriented. And so some of this work is in partnership with the city and we've been doing this. This is also in another neighborhood where we're going and reimagining what an area could be like if we took that that street and made it more pedestrian friendly and this is another partnership. It's kind of like Spark in that we're going to go to these, these locations and test these things out with, with the Department of Public Works to make a, a better street for people. This one where there's kind of a little section of a street that doesn't need to be there so we're talking to them about just abandoning it to, to make it a, a place for people. So, so that's that's all the stuff that we do, um, kind of. Um, there's more.